Well, welcome everyone, <clears throat> strength and honor to you. And uh, we greet you tonight in Jesus joy, grateful to see the breaking of another day um, that God has been faithful to us and given us this brand new day, um, new mercies, new grace, new favor um, in this day. And um, we give God praise. Um, thank, uh, I wanna thank God for all that has joined us tonight um, and uh, to our guests that have um, joined tonight. Um, God bless you to you. And uh, thank you for connecting with us tonight. And um, grateful for another time of encounter into the, in the word of the Lord. Um, we're just going to get ready uh, to get into the class tonight. Uh, but let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you tonight and we give you praise. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your favor. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Father, we thank you that you are God. <clears throat> And beside you, there is no other. We thank you that you still rule and reign on the throne, that there is nothing that happens, Lord God, in the realm of men that is beyond your wisdom or your power or your purpose and plan. And we thank you, Lord God, that as <clears throat> your people in the earth, we thank you that we have relationship and covenant with you. Thank you that you said that when we pray, that not only do you hear us, but Father, that you give us the request that we have asked of you. And so we thank you tonight that as we pray continually for our world, we pray for the conditions of our world, that in this world, Lord, in the earth, I pray, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done um, in the earth. Lord God, as you have determined it for it to be in heaven. Father, we agree in prayer tonight. Uh, for Sister Melinda's grandmother. We thank you that you are the Lord God, her healer. Father, we thank you that you even knew that this situation would, uh, would happen. And I thank you for your provision of healing and restoration that you've already made available through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so we call her grandmother healed. We pray, Father, that you would, by your spirit, begin to work in her body to bring healing uh, to every area, Lord God, that there is pain um, that there is a, where she was afflicted. We thank you for your healing virtue. The same way you healed the woman with the issue of blood and she was made every whit whole. Father, we decree the same healing virtue flow in Sister Melinda's grandmother's body from the crown of her head to the sole of her feet. Lord, even in her bones, Lord, the structure of her bones. Father, we thank you for bringing healing, strength, and restoration in the strong name of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that for any who are sick, we decree your word out of Isaiah, uh, Lord, uh, that they, by your stripes, they are healed. And we decree it in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Well, can we just take a moment and just uh, put our hands together and just give God praise tonight. Amen. For the goodness of the Lord. Uh, for the favor of God, for the mercy of God, amen, for the protection of God, for the healing of God, glory to God. We give him praise for the wisdom of God, hallelujah. We give him praise for truth, amen. Even in terms of truth, we do not take for granted the fact that we are in the truth because we could be many other places, but it's only the favor, the goodness of God that we even know the truth and we are able to walk in truth. So we give God praise for that tonight. And uh, we praise him for freedom. Glory to God. Glory to God. One of the things we should never do as in the United States is, is uh, forget to give God praise for the freedom that we enjoy. Uh, because there are other brothers and sisters that are in the world that are not able to enjoy the luxury of freedom, uh, the freedom to worship God whenever they want to and wherever they want to. Um, they, they, they are under um, a, a persecution and they're not as free as we are. And so we should never fail to give God praise for the freedom we enjoy, um, nor feel entitled or take that for granted because at any moment, anything could change except for the grace of God. And so we're grateful tonight. Um, I wanna um, start back with our class tonight um, where we picked up, uh, to pick up where we left off at last week. And we were talking about the subject of spiritual maturity. Um, and spiritual growth. And we know that growth is um, mandatory or necessary um, in the spirit 
as well as it is in the natural, as we look at um, our natural bodies and we see the plan and purpose of God in terms of growth, um, how it is um, the plan of God for us to grow, uh, because most of us know that, you know, even where we are tonight, I'm talking about physically, when we were born into the world, we are not in the same place, we're not the same size, the same nothing that we were when we were born into the world. So we know that growth is a part of the plan of God. It's in the plan of God. Everything must grow. Everything must change. Um, in order for growth to happen, there has to be um, shifts. There has to be changes. There are transitions that we have to go through. There are certain laws uh, that we have to follow in order to facilitate growth. And so when we talk about spiritual growth tonight, um, spiritual growth is really the process of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Um, while we know we, we um, uh, in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 18 says that we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, so the grace that is given to us and the knowledge of who God is, is intended by God to facilitate us as a believer to grow into grace is the power. That is the favor, that is the benefit of God, that's the power, enablement of God on us. The knowledge of God is what is what we are to grow um, into, not only the knowledge of God, but grace enables us to become that knowledge. The Bible says, as he, he is, so are we in this world. And we all know that Jesus is the pattern son that his life in the earth was really a model, a pattern, um, really to show mankind how um, being God-like is supposed to be walked out in the earth. And so if someone could get for me, um, well, before we go there, there were five, there were five things that we we left off with on last week. Um, before we uh, we get to the scriptures, um, can anyone tell me any one of those, there were five things, the five points that we talked about last week. Um, does anybody remember um, any of those? We talked about believe and receive, mm -hmm. study, application, lifestyles, and service. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And... Um, and we know that those, those are important when we're talking about growing um, and coming into the image of God, because while it is the plan and purpose of God, um, it does not just happen. There are things that have to be done in order to facilitate even our bodies, right? Uh, when you look at your natural body, um, part of our responsibility is uh, eating and not just eating, but um, that, that responsibility of eating um, is to be done. There are certain kinds of food that we should eat that will facilitate a more excellent life of health. While there are many choices of food that you can eat, but the, your, your choice of what you eat will determine the quality of life you enjoy. So even in a natural sense, um, even something as practical as eating, um, there is a responsibility that we have to, as a believer, because the body, um, this body has been given to us by God. And so we exercise maturity in one way, um, even in terms of how we uh, take care of the temple. So there are certain things that we need to do uh, for that. And so even as so as in the natural, so as in the spirit. And uh, there are certain things that we have to do to facilitate growth. It does not automatically happen. And if you just leave things up to chance, what will happen is if you leave it up to chance, you'll just get whatever comes to you. And you'll not have a part in it. And look, this is how important it is for this. As I said on last week, that even when a baby is born into the world, God assigns parents to babies because the wisdom of God is a baby is not able 
to do what is what is necessary to facilitate its growth. It is not able to assume that responsibility. So God assigns parents that will stand in the stead to not only do what is necessary to facilitate proper growth for this child, but then also teach, train, and develop as well so that the child is not just having things done for, in, in, for, in, for it, but it is also learning at the same time how to do these things for themselves. Because what happens is that's when they, that's when you start, that's how you measure the process of growth. Okay, so when we talk about spiritual growth, we're talking about when a person um, comes into the uh, uh, ability of taking on responsibilities as an adult uh, or being able to uh, handle adult family responsibilities. Okay, as a, as a child of God, a son of God. Um, the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Do good to them that despitefully use you. Now, to walk in spiritual maturity means that you and, you and I have to take on or take up the responsibility of loving somebody, those who have done, you know, he said, uh, do good to them that despite what he used you. So now to do good to somebody that has done wrong to you is a, is a spiritual responsibility. And it takes a mature person to do that. Because someone who is a child that have not developed this um, ability in them, it's in them, but they have not cultivated and develop it. Whenever something happens, um, there will be someone that would have to help walk them through it and then teach and train them how, how to forgive, okay? Forgiving is a spiritual responsibility. That's an adult, and in, in terms of the spirit sense, that is an adult family responsibility. And you say, well, well what do you mean by that? The Bible says that Peter, and when Jesus was teaching, the disciples came to him, and because the spirit of offense or offenses was common then, Peter says, well, if your brother offend you, how often should I forgive? And the law says seven times, seven, uh, seven, seven times, I believe. Seventy times seven. And um, but Jesus said, okay, that that is that is the law, that is the teacher that first taught you that you should forgive. He says, but now when you become an adult in me, you'll forgive as many times as need to be done. And I wanna say this, that it takes a spiritual maturity to forgive um, someone who has done you wrong. It does. So when we talk about spiritual maturity, we're talking about really a spiritual maturity, spiritual growth, we're actually talking about becoming more and more like Christ. The more we become like Christ, the more we are able to handle and do um, spiritual things. Um, someone give for me Genesis chapter one, verse 27. Um, someone give for me 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49. And I just want to and then uh, one more, someone get for me, please. Romans chapter eight, verse 29. Apostle, can you give those uh, scriptures again, please? Yes, Genesis chapter one, verse 27. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 49. And Romans chapter eight, verse 29. I have Genesis chapter one, verse 27. Okay, thank you. If you could read it. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Okay, so now we see where in Genesis, the book of beginnings, um, which shows us the blueprint, the plan, the purpose of God, what was in is what is in the heart of God concerning man, is that God created man and woman uh, or mankind um, to be in his image. So if there is an image um, that we are to, as believers, we are to show forth. It is the image of God. It is not our image. And then we'll see even more that there's a responsibility, um, um, even in terms of spiritual growth, that we grow into being mature of stewarding and demonstrating the image of God. Because people have seen a lot of images. We've seen a lot of images in the earth. But not every image in the earth is an image that accurately represents God. And when people see us, they should see the image of God or really the essence of God. It's the, the, the character, the nature, the DNA of God. When people see us, that's what they should see, which is completely opposite from the world system. So Satan comes to try to corrupt the image um, of righteousness instead of it being the image of righteousness, which is of God. Um, the enemy tries to corrupt or alter or change or pervert the image to become like him, and um, which is unrighteous, unjust, unloving. Okay. Um, someone had First Corinthians fifteen. I have an apostle. Okay. First Corinthians fifteen and forty nine, and as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Amen. And so you know again when we know all of us can relate to this in our natural family, um, the images, you know, who we, 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 we not only represent, but how, who we resemble, who we look like, the image, the likeness um, in the earth realm. And, um, uh, you know, in terms of natural family and, you know, we persons, you know, we can be identified, uh, people can identify you um, from the family based on your, your resemblance, who you look like, how you act. And so those are ways that um, we bear the image of and the likenesses of in an earthly sense. And then it goes on further, a little bit more deeper, that says when we were in sin, we bore that, that image. But then when we come to Christ and we become saved, now we have the heavenly image, the image of Christ, the image of righteousness that we are to bear on the inside. You know, like the, we used to, we've heard this for those that come up in church when we say the things I used to do, I don't do no more. The place I used to go, I don't go no more. What they're actually singing about is an image change, a lifestyle change that we, I no longer bear the image or the responsibility, the resemblance or likeness of who I was in sin, but now I bear the likeness, the image of Christ, um, Jesus Christ, my redeemer, my savior, and the image of right, righteousness. Okay, one more scripture, Romans 8, 29. I, have, I got a little bit background going on. Okay. Somebody else. Because yes. I'm based. For whom yes. he for sex for new, he also predestined to, to conform to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brothers. Okay. So in Romans, it tells us that we were predestined. In other words, this was a decision that God determined before the foundation of the world that those who would come to Christ that we would bear the image of his son, uh, Jesus Christ, that we would be in that same likeness and same image um, as we were 
with Christ uh, so that um, uh, those who are of Christ could be recognized as those that are in the family. Okay. And because God wants family and God is about family, Jesus was the firstborn among many brothers because he was the first seed that birthed a harvest of all of us. So we become the, the, the many brethren that is supposed to um, mirror or look like Jesus and act like Jesus. And, and most of us know how Jesus lived in the earth. That is how we're supposed to live. Amen. Okay, so now, um, did anyone have any comments or questions? Okay. So, so now, if Apostle, we look at, yes. Apostle, as you were talking, I was, I, I turned to Matthew, and we were talking about look at his image. Remember when Peter denied Jesus, and Jesus was taken away at night to the court. And the girl in the courtyard, that's in uh, Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 through 75. And they were telling Peter, they told Peter, you was with him. He was with Jesus so long that his speech sounded like Jesus. And Peter tried to deny it, but the people kept telling him, no, you sound like him. And so I'm reminded that the more we, what you're saying is the more we mature, and uh, our growth, we are going to sound and look like Jesus. And no matter how we try to deny, it's going to show. It will show. Amen. Great example. Great example. And, you know, and that goes um, back to uh, earlier teachings where we, when we were talking about discipleship and disciples, how that a disciple is not just a person who follows the teaching of a teacher but in bible times the 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 uh clear definition for a disciple was a person that so followed the teaching of a teacher that they literally their life became an imitation of that teacher in other words when you saw the, the student you saw the teacher when you saw the teacher you saw the student because they so embraced the teaching that it was not just to hear or not just to uh, memorize, but it was for them to become. And literally, that's how when uh, when when they was when you will see and we read in the Bible how even with John, when they had John, they were followers that followed John. They did that when the when people saw the ones that followed John or John disciples they could identify John's disciples because his disciples so embody John's message of, and teaching about repentance and what John was doing that they look like John. That's why, they could that's why they could readily identify them. And so when we talk about really spiritual growth and maturity, it's really literally like we grow into, we grow into, in case in point, um, in John, St. John chapter 1, verse 12, says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become. Not just power to understand what I'm saying, but he's, he, the Bible says that God gave us power to become. And so you know uh, when you when you are becoming something, because now you're able to, to take on that responsibility. Uh, 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 you're able to steward and function in that responsibility. That's why I said, you know, when you talk about um, um, Jesus, man, when we look at uh, Matthew chapter five, everything that Jesus taught on that mountain in the Beatitudes in chapter five was direct contrast or opposition against what the world system was. But Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to walk with me, this is what my kingdom looks like. And these are the things that you're going to have to do. And we have to grow into that. When you, when you are first born, according to Romans chapter 10, and you first become a believer, listen, 
the the ability is in you but it, remember the scenario i said about a baby being born into the world he has to be assigned parents that has to number one model then number two have to facilitate for them then number three train them so that it can cultivate the ability that's in them Okay, so now let's take that model, for example. Let's look at a, a family in the natural. Can anybody tell me, when looking at the family in the natural, how important do you think it would be for a husband and a wife to have a child or children for the children to grow up or to mature, to grow? Or does it really matter? Can they just stay a baby? Apostle, when you think about um, any parent would want their child to not only to um, grow up, but even uh, it's, it's a, a form of flattery when um, uh, you see your child imitating the things that you do, especially uh, uh, good things. So it matters how they how they grow, how they mature, and it also matters that they, um, because you you are the image that they see. You you are um, the uh, I guess the first line of of their imitation of things. You know, um, so it matters how how they grow, how they change, and what they imitate. Um, when you see them imitating something outside of the home or outside of what you do, you know, um, especially when, when kids start to go to school, um, they do often imitate what they see other children doing or, or um, um, other children doing in school. And so it's important that uh, a foundation for the parent, um, from the parent be laid. Um, for that child to be able to have a guideline to go through. So it, it, it matters um, how your children grow and mature and that they're not still at a level of immaturity. And if they are, then, then it's your responsibility to check that. Okay. Apostle, yes. I was also thinking about um, when once the children grow up, and they become adults and they go into the world and begin to have uh, families of their own. Then they begin to, that they mature enough to establish, to, to carry on the legacy of what they were taught. Um, right living, right standing, being able to handle finances, um, maturing in a way that they have control of their emotions and making good decisions because this is what they now begin to teach their children. And then their children learn from them. And then their children grow up in these things. And when they get old enough, they teach, their, they have their own children. And it begins to um, create generational um, maturity and, and in, in that aspect. If we don't teach our children certain things um, or parents don't teach their children and allow them to mature in the right things, then they cause a generational breakdown in the family and in the legacy of the family. Okay, so so uh, if a child doesn't uh, if, if a child doesn't grow and it don't and it's, the parent is not facilitating the growth of a child, then it impacts the future life. Okay. Uh, also, Apostle, I was going to say, as a parent or even a guardian, when a, a babe, a child is put into your care, if that child is not growing and grasping, it brings anxiety. It brings fear that something is wrong with that child. So there's a pressure that comes also when a child does not grow properly, and then there's a need to take them to the doctor and do different things. So it brings another level of uh, anxiety 
to the parent and into the household, uh, even a, a certain amount of fear that, you know what, something is wrong here because they should be walking by now. They should be talking by now. These are just some basic things that if you don't see it in a child as a parent, it's going to bring some level of concern. So even before you can even get them to the part where you're talking about a level of responsibility of things you teach, just the basic things that they should be doing, crawling. If you don't see it as a parent, <laughs> it's going to grip you. So, I mean, we're not even talking about when they get eight years old, but I'm just talking about just as a babe, if something is not happening, because you that was the question you asked, it's going to bring something in that house. But now if you see that child is growing properly uh, and doing the things that they should, uh, there's a peace that's in the household. There's some joy that's in the household, the love in the household. And not only is it with the parent, but it's also with the child because there's some comfort and camaraderie there when everything is going well. But when it's not, then you're going to have a whole nother level of spiritual, again, even physical things that could be happening in the house. Amen. And so, you know, and, 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 and when we look at that, like you said, it does cause distress because even in the natural, um, there is a progression. There is actually a chart, a way that they measure growth and that there are certain things that um, babies, infants on up through, through um, certain age brackets are supposed to be doing. Um, and I think the, it's a, I, I, I want, for the lack of words, metric. There is a metric that they use to measure uh, what they call healthy growth or proper growth. So that if you see any of these signs not being in place, then that is to alert the parent, the person who is the guardian, the overseer over this child's life, that there is something wrong in the progression, that this needs to be looked at. There's an, and a, some attention that needs to be given to this because in the part of what is supposed to be a natural growth process, there is a problem here. So that, that lets the uh, parent know that there's something that needs to be done um, in order to help facilitate um, growth. And um, because like I said, it does cause distress. It causes this ease. And, and how about this? The longer it takes a child to grow, the longer the parent becomes responsible. Because what happens is for as long as the child stays a child and does not grow, the parent is not able to be um, expand or to grow or to be uh, free. And watch this, the whole purpose of growth is that child is supposed to become a mirror, a pattern of what the parent is because eventually the child will grow up, get married and have children. So you see that how the pattern goes? And then that child who was once a child who had parents that facilitated, developed, trained, modeled for it, uh, what adulthood was like, now becomes what the parent was. And it becomes now a teacher. The Bible says that the whole, one of the purposes of spiritual growth and maturity is that we, we no longer are children. That we become able now to handle the adult responsibility of spiritual maturity, of being a son of God, a child of God. So when we talk about those five things, uh, uh, when we talk about those five things that we mentioned earlier, when we talk about believe and receive, um, those are, those are, it's necessary to believe and receive because you can't do anything without that. That's that's when when you believe and receive, that's being born. You, that's the baby stage. So then when we talk about study, and study is important because that's um, that has to do with your diet. 
application has to do with you putting uh you working things out work out your soul stuff but you have to there is a work there's an investment that we have to do um to help facilitate it then the walk has to do with your lifestyle and of course your service um so that we um we are in the image and we model and we become um like christ okay uh, did anyone have any um, any other questions or comments? Okay, so let's let's um, let's look at. I want to get to some of the things that um, ways that we facilitate um, some more ways that we facilitate spiritual growth. Um, awesome. Yeah, yes, is, I hear someone. It's Cheney. Yes. I I was thinking as you all were talking about parents and um, as parents, parenting is is part of is part of our ministry because you can easily. I was as you, you were talking about kids growing up and sort of following a pattern, but you could easily um, discourage your children from following in your pattern if you're not doing it right. If you are. Um, uh, not really representing what Jesus, who Jesus was. If you're not, if you're not, you know, being loving and all of those different things you hear about pe parents or children whose parent, for example, was not in their life and they grow up or their parent ruled with an iron fist and so on and so forth. And they go the opposite direction because they have a desire to not be like that person. So I think that, um, I was just thinking about that as we were talking, like who we are to our kids matters so much because there's an imprint um that we leave amen and um and that's the whole idea of god uh giving parents because again um as a babe a child um god will give you someone as a model everything about jesus his birth his life uh his crucifixion burial and resurrection all was a parenting work that modeled for us to show us and to train us of how we should be which is when which is why we read in the scripture um uh in romans that that we were preordained uh for this walk lifestyle um so that Jesus became the firstborn among many brethren. So, you know, having a, because uh, God wanted a family with, with many children as opposed to just one son. He wanted um, a family. And uh, so, so Jesus was the seed um, and he was the, the model, the prototype, the pattern that, that um, he, he taught the 12, he trained them, he lived it before them, he modeled it, he taught them. And then Jesus also facilitated in them um, so much so to like uh, Prophet Curran said that when he was in the moment of his passion, um, Peter was by the fire warming himself um, that um, even the, the Jesus facilitating the image of who Christ is, the knowledge of God in him, that it was so much uh, that Peter didn't even realize that even in his speech, he was identified as being one of those with Jesus. And so that's, that's where we're actually going in terms of the purpose of the lesson when we talk about spiritual growth. Um, uh, Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I did childish things, but when I grew up, I put those things away. And this is why we're talking about a lesson uh, about spiritual growth, because um, in this hour, um, the body of Christ needs to, um, to be able to take hold of the spiritual responsibilities um, as sons. And I tell you, if it's one thing among many that have really, um, even in these past days, um, really just affirm and continue to um, call, uh, bring this awareness um, to me, um, the need for uh, maturity is that there are so many saints that 
um, that are going home. And there has to be someone, um, even when we look at the story of Elijah and Elisha, we see this model, this pattern again. Because there was coming a day when Elijah had to be taken up from the earth. And God did not want that place to be vacant. And so he had Elijah as, um, as a parent type model to train, to develop and facilitate in Elisha um, righteousness and the things of God so that when Elijah's time came to be lifted up from the earth, um, there would not be a vacancy that the work of the Lord could still go on because God is about succession. That's why we're here. That's why everything that Jesus did was about succession, having a family, modeling, training, developing, showing us how to do, what to do, so that we can take up that work. He said to the disciples when uh, he was going to be lifted up in the same manner as like Elijah, he said to the disciples, he said, now I want you to go, teach all nations, make disciples, so that there is no void, that there's no vacuum. The same thing I did with you is what I want you to do with others. And that's why I said, you know, it is a parents, while they experience the joy of raising children and facilitating their growth and everything, it is much bigger than just the joy of helping them uh, grow and seeing them grow and, and, and experiencing moments with them. There is a, a, a destination. There is a purpose and a point to this beyond that. And that goal is that this child will one day grow up mature, that they can take on the same responsibilities as the parent and begin to live and do and act out those kinds of things as, as they raise their children. So um, um, one of the ways um, God uses when he, when he facilitates growth is pastors. Um, someone get for me Jeremiah 3, uh, verse 15, please. Oh, excuse me, Apostle, can I ask you a question? Yes. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Okay, um, I, what I would like to ask you is um, I hear uh, you talk about uh, the renewal, the renewal of the mind and yes. the, um, how we'll, we'll start to change the way we think and we'll start to react um, to things differently. And now I'm hearing um, you talk about the more that we become Christ-like, um, will uh, the, the re okay okay we you said the more that we become Christ-like, we'll become like Christ. And I hear in church about um, of, of the saints. And like uh, our disciples that we have in our ministry, like evangelists uh, Lisa and Prophets Kern. So what I would like to know is, 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 is there ever a point uh, when, when we get uh, to be a saint and a disciple and um, more like Christ, is there ever a point that we will never sin again no and i'll tell you why because as long as satan is in the earth the potential and the possibility to sin is always there and number two the sin nature on the inside of us the bible calls it the old man which is the potential of sinning is still there and this is why when we talk about this and that's that was a great question you brought up by the way um, because, and I'll tell you why it's a great question, because this really goes along with why we're talking about spiritual maturity, because once you mature, you, uh, maturity does not mean you get to a place where you never sin. Maturity means that you have come to a place where you no longer give in to sin. Okay. Because as a believer, you have a choice. Like if you wanted to do something wrong, now, I know a lot of times people like to really um, mysticize this and make it really spiritual and deep. And it's like, oh, the Holy Ghost got me. 
yeah, he got you, but he's not going to stop you. Okay. He has you in the sense of the Holy Ghost will tell you when you get ready to go make, make a decision to do something um, that's wrong, that's against God, the Holy Spirit will let you know this is not of God. This is not right. This is not, this is wrong. You should not do this. The Holy Spirit will tell you that, but he's not going to make you not do it. Because for him to make you not do wrong would, would go against the word and the order of God because we have free will. Okay. So, so maturity means I, there is an opportunity to do wrong presented to me. But now that I've grown up in Christ, I'm matured and, um, in God and I'm become as an adult um, in Christ spiritually, I, I, re, I do not um, give in to that opportunity. Let me, let, me, let me give it to another way. Let me go back to an um, early example I used. Like if somebody do wrong to you. Now, in your flesh, your flesh would want to retaliate. And you would, you, you know, you would, you would be, and of course, be upset. But, but Jesus said, he said, forgive. So yeah. a spiritual, a spiritual uh, adult, a person who is mature spiritually says, okay, I have a choice here. I can either, I can hold them in unforgiveness and not forgive them and keep remembering what they did. And then when I see them, remind them what they did. Or as a spiritual uh, mature saint, I can forgive them because that's what Jesus did. Everything he did, when he, when he got on the cross, he said what? Father, forgive, forgive them, them. For they know not what they do. Amen. So spiritual maturity says, I've come to an understanding, yes, they did me wrong, but I also know that in terms of what's right and what's wrong, they don't really know what they're doing. And so if I'm going to imitate Christ, Christ forgave, so I forgive. And one of the, one of the ways that the enemy fights us with forgiveness is try to make us think that people are getting away or getting off with something that they do. And that's really not true. Because the Bible says, whatever man sow, he reaps. And then the Bible also says that every man will stand before God to give an account. And here is, here is another way you know you mature. When you do what's right, not expecting God to vindicate you. But you do what's right just because you know it's what God said to do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Because he just, uh, you, you, you know, sometimes people grow in that. It's like, well, you know, you move from, you know, holding people in unforgiveness. Okay, so now you're growing a little bit and say, okay, I'm going to forgive them. But at this stage, you, you're forgiving them because you're, I'm, I'm, I'm going to forgive them, Jesus, because I know you said they're going to reap with their soul and vengeance is mine. So I'm going to sit here and I forgive them, but I'm going to sit here and wait to see what you're going to do to them. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's still immature. You haven't grown up yet. Yes. So when you fully mature, and that's, this is why I'm saying this, uh, Sister Will, and that's a great question, actually, um, because it shows you there is a progressive life, and that's why the Lord gave it to me about a baby. A baby grows, and all of us know, as a baby, man, we made so many mistakes as a baby. Oh, my Lord. We had to learn. And how many of us remember this classic one? Your parent, you know, your mom or dad, or whoever in the kitchen, they cooking, and you come in as a child, and they say, don't put your hand on the stove, baby. And of course, you know, that that nature, that that flesh nature, and say, you know, try it. And if you put your hand on the stove, it's going to burn you. But, you know, you, you don't have no reference point, no experience for that. Well, I, I'm going to try it. Put your hand on it, and sure enough, just like they say, you get burned. So we grow. That's why the Bible says grow in grace. And this is why a mature believer won't hold people, won't judge people. Because guess what? Somebody had to be patient with us until we grow up, until we became mature. So great question, actually. Great question. So, yeah, so um, short answer <laughs> is that, um, is that um, no, the potential for sin will always be here until Jesus comes, uh, raptures the church, um, and, and uh, well, let's just say this, until 
after the millennium. I don't want to get too far in that. When death, hell, and gray, death, hell, and the gray, and Satan is cast into the lake of fire. But until now, until that time, the potential to sin is always there. Um, the scripture says, um, and I forget it's in Proverbs. I believe I can't remember it's in Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. It said a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up. Uh, so, so we have uh, some hands. Okay. Yes. Um, hi, Apostle. I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what you um, was saying about as we are um, spiritually mature, when we forgive somebody, <clears throat> we don't just sit around and wait for God to do whatever he's going to do, whenever he's going to do it. But when it happens, a spiritual person, well, I can, I can only speak for, for me. I'm, I'm thinking about a time where years ago I was unjustly accused of something on my job and um, by my supervisor, but it all boiled down to she was jealous because the patients wanted to come see me and not her because she she did not understand them like I did because she was white and I was black and was in a black community. Um, so she did all of this stuff. Anyway, long story short, <clears throat> I left the job and about a year or two later, I, I said nothing. You know, people would call me from the job, ask me, Beverly, how do you do this? And I'm like, why am I, why? <laughs> at first, my reaction was, why am I telling you? Ask the one that's there. Like, like, she doesn't know, you know, but I went ahead and helped them. And about a couple years later, one of um, the ladies from that job called me and told me, that the um, supervisor had been diagnosed with cancer. And I was just like, oh my gosh, it was, it was instead of the reaction like that's just what she get, I felt so sorry and I had just so much compassion. So I think the more we mature, when we do see God's vengeance, we won't be like, See, I was just waiting, but we will have compassion and mercy on that person and ask God, you know, even before that, just to forgive them and to have mercy on them because I would rather be, I'd rather have man do something to me instead of God do something to me. But I was thinking about that, you know, as we mature, we don't just wait around. And um, when God does, if he does something to quote unquote, get the person back for um, offending us or doing wrong to us, we won't be happy about it. We'll be kind of sad about it. Amen. Amen. Was there someone else? The Bible says of the prodigal son that when he, in immaturity, came to his father and said, you know what? I want all my, I want my goods. I want what is supposed to be mine and I want to take it. And I, I want to go out. It was, it was against the father because it was supposed to be his inheritance. And as a son, um, being a part of the household, but the father gave it to him and released him. But the father never took the opportunity to be, he never took the opportunity to be offended because he understood that this son did not really understand his, his responsibility. He was a child and torn, and there were some things that he needed to learn. So the father gave him grace and the father was patient. And you said, well, well how do you know that? Because the Bible says that when the time came for the son, the prodigal son, when he came to himself, he said, listen, I had it better. The, the servants have it better in my father's house. And look at where I am. I ain't got no business being here. I'm a king's kid. And the Bible said, when he came to himself, when the, the right mind of Christ came to him, he said, I'm going to go home. And the Bible says that when the son came, before he got to the house, the father was standing outside the house because he knew, watch this, 
the grace, the patience, the long suffering, all these are all fruit of the spirit, kindness, right? Gentleness, all of these things, the father sowed. And I want you to catch this part. See that he sowed that created a place for the son to come back. So when we, when we, are, when we do not, as, a, as a, a mature adult, when we hold people in unforgiveness, what happens is you seal off a place for them to be reconciled. You, and, and literally what you are doing, you are withholding your bowels from them. Hallelujah. 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 Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, 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 so listen, when you mature, you move past everything being about you. And you understand there's a higher purpose, there's a higher call. You become the vessel of reconciliation. Yes, they did you wrong. But when you and I, we, we, we demonstrate the image and the character and the knowledge of God, and we act like spiritual, that's how we birth. We birth people into the kingdom of God. You cannot take it personal. A mature adult that takes on spiritual um, adult responsibilities, do not take things personal. And, um, and I think if we look at it from that standpoint, um, and the other thing is we forget too, when we do not forgive, when we do not uh, do good to people, even though they did us wrong. Now, now let me just pause here for a moment. When I say do good to them who have despitefully used you, the Bible said don't pull a snake in your, your, your bosom. So when, when you know people that have not gotten to that place, you don't bring them into a vulnerable place. What that means is you still do good to them. You love them with the love of the Lord. That don't mean you have to make yourself, you don't have to be, you know, uh, un submit yourself under that, that, you know, that's not what the scripture means. The scripture means you still be kind to them. You pray for them. If they need help with something and it's in your power to do it, um, then you can do that. Um, but you do not bring them into another place where um, they can just keep um, facilitating hurt or damage. Okay, you pray for them, you love them, um, you, you're good to them, you don't hold them in unforgiveness, those kinds of things, because that says that, you know, you are mature. And, you, and, and because none of us know the end result of any soul, only God does. That's why God said, don't judge. Um, we ought to love. Um, so so we, ought to, we ought to do that. Um, oh my, our time is gone again. Praise God, praise God. But um, I, I wanna, um, does someone have Jeremiah 3, 15? I have it a pocket. Okay, and um, someone get for me quickly, I don't wanna do this, I wanna do this quickly. Second Chronicles uh, chapter 20, verse 20. Okay. Um, Jeremiah 3 and 15 reads, um, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Okay, so pastors, God, is, he gives, again, as we talked about the model of spiritual parents um, or someone who is assigned the responsibility as the overseer over your soul. Um, they are required to not only feed, which, which speaks of facilitating, um, doing those things that facilitate growth, uh, but they are to also model it. Uh, because one of the ways God facilitates our growth is through gifts that he endows um, wisdom and knowledge um, and the ability um, to, to help facilitate. And watch this. When, when pastors feed or when they give or impart wisdom, 
what it literally is doing, it's not giving you something you don't have because the word um, and passes everything, the gifting, the function is supposed to activate and ignite something that is already in you to cultivate, to bring to life, uh, to cause to uh, awaken um, um, and to feed that, that is gonna facilitate the right growth. Um, okay, Second uh, Chronicles 2020. I've got Second Chronicles Apostle. Okay. All right, it's in the ESV, if that's all right. Yes, that's fine. Verse 20, and they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. Okay. So spiritual growth is another way of succeeding. Um, overcoming, facilitating victory, uh, which is what it's talking about uh, being established. And he said, believe. Your, uh, uh, believe in the Lord your God, you shall be established. Believe as prop prophets, so shall you prosper. Okay, so, and we know prosper has everything to do with a person's well-being or being well, doing well, um, um, or becoming, again, uh, like Christ, the image of Christ. And in this particular case, the outcome that, that was supposed to happen happened because uh, they they believed God, it was established, but then uh, believed the prophets, the word of the prophet, because in this story, um, when, when Jeremiah was given the word of the, the prophet, gave him the word and told him what to do, and they obeyed that word, then the outcome that they were supposed to have and the outcome that the word declared happened. And so it, kind of, it facilitate um, not only spiritual growth, maturity, but also um, profitability, well-being, success, victory, okay? Because victory is a part of, of, is in our DNA in terms of growing. Because if you're, you're, if you never have any victory, you're not really growing. So that as pastors, then the prophets, Okay, um, and I'm going to stop there tonight. Uh, there are more, but we can uh, we'll uh, we'll touch we'll deal with those at a at a later time. But um, does anyone have any questions? Any comments? Um, so I'm going to say uh, um, I think that the um, teaching that we're getting right now is just really good with four. Uh, the season that we are coming into, especially after coming off our fast in January. And now here we are in the second month, um, the month of agreement, meaning agreement for us to come in agreement with the word of God and to come to a level of maturity that will um, help us to, um, to be able to become the kings, the heirs, um, to, to, uh, be able to do what it is that we have been called to do, but it does require a level of maturity, a greater understanding of maturity and, and what we are to do. Because in the mindset of a child, there's not much you can do, um, but at a level of maturity, God can then begin to release the things that he has promised and, and we are able to handle those things. Amen, amen, because a child, at that stage does not have the capability to live as an adult. And um, and this is one of the things I wanna say um, um, as we end our class tonight, that this is something that we have to understand as believers that um, it's all by choice. It's by choice. And um, um, we, we, when, you, when you begin to mature, then you understand that no matter what the enemy presents, no matter what opportunities the enemy present to us um, uh, to do wrong, we do not have to just fall into that. Um, we have a choice. 
we can actually choose. And I think one of the one of the, the ways that the enemy uh, tries to deceive us with making choices to be victorious, uh, to make choices to obey the word of the Lord, is he tries to manipulate feelings. And we have to remember nothing about the kingdom of God um, has to do, feelings will never facilitate the work of God. Faith will. And it takes faith to obey the word of the Lord because you have to obey and do what the word says before you actually see it physically manifest. So forgiveness is a work of faith because you have to do it before you see the results. Watch this. And you have to do it in case you never see the results. Just know that the word of the Lord never goes, um, never fails ever. In Isaiah 55, I believe, he said, as the snow comes down and the rain and does not return void, he says, so is my word that comes down, that waters the ground, causes it to bud and bring forth. So even if you do not see a physical manifestation in terms of if somebody never comes back to you and say, I'm sorry, just, just be comforted in knowing that you did, you fulfilled righteousness by forgiving and releasing them. Because you know what that does? Forgiveness really develops you, the person that's doing the forgiving. Repentance really develops the person that's repenting. And it starts to cultivate in you a greater capacity of spiritual maturity to be able to handle spiritual things. Because you know what? Forgiving is a responsibility. Loving is a responsibility. Oh, yes, Lord. Honoring is a responsibility. Amen doing good to those or doing good to people is a responsibility. And all of it, faith is how, is what facilitates, it enables us to facilitate that. Amen. All right, um, anyone else? Praise God. Amen. Well, thank you all tonight for um, joining us for Kingdom Academy. And um, we believe that the word of the Lord um, is always profitable, that the word of the Lord is always victorious, always. And um, we believe that as we have um, been in the word of the Lord, that the Holy Spirit would begin to cause that word to be illuminated in our hearts. That as the Bible says, that the day star would arise in our hearts. The life of God, the light of God would shine bright in our hearts as we uh, go about to uh, be Christ-like in the earth. So I pray that this be the year that we grow in areas that have been a challenge to us um, that we, uh, by faith, um, step into uh, greater areas and measures of spiritual growth that we grow, that we see um, Christ in us growing and that we grow in him and the grace and knowledge of who he is. That today, this year, we stand in a knowledge of God that we did not stand in before, that God is glorified and that the works of the enemy is destroyed in Jesus' name. Have a great night. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. May God bless you. May he make you a thousand times more than you already are. And may he bless you as he has promised you. You and your household is my prayer in Jesus' name. Have a great night. Thank you for the class tonight, Apostle. Great work. Amen. Thank God for everyone.
ignite people to fly to be bad and have a night. Peace be unto you as well. Have a great night. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye. Bye.